Good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, just to begin with a couple of housekeeping, if you could uh, please switch your phones to yes. silent um, to avoid any embarrassment. Um, to, uh, to let you know that the uh, initial uh, presentation will be on the record and the question and answer session thereafter will be subject to the Chatham House rule. And if you could identify yourself when um, uh, you are uh, pitching a question. Uh, but before we start, um, this uh, series of uh, presentations we've been having is uh, very generously supported by Irish Aid. So uh, uh, to introduce the, the speaker, may I ask uh, Rory de Burke, as the Director General of Irish Aid, to say a few words. Thank you, Rory. Afternoon, everyone. Um, just many thanks for your introduction, Barry, um, and uh, to the Institute for hosting this seminar today. Um, this has been a, a very, very good series of collaborations um, on the Development Matters series, uh, and it's particularly, uh, particularly good um, that we have Charlotte Petrie Gornitska with us today from Paris, uh, where she chairs the OECD Development Assistance Committee, commonly known as the DAC. And I think it's important that we take that discussion that happens in Paris to practitioners here in Ireland and sort of, sort of break that imaginary boundary that may be between what the Development uh, Assistance Committee does and the discussions uh, in places like this, and not just here, but more generally. Um, Charlotte was uh, formerly the head of CEDA, which is the Swedish Development Cooperation Agency, and she was appointed to the chair of the DAC uh, in July 2016. And uh, I think she's played a very, very important role in spearheading the DAC reform agenda uh, since taking up her appointment. And spearheaded is probably the right word because she's probably needed a very sharp implement at times to, to, to make sure that she navigates, I'm mixing a metaphor here, but uh, to, to navigate through, through what is uh, an awful lot of very, very forthright opinions, visions, and uh, at times contradictory uh, I suppose ethical agendas might be the right way to put it. Um, she comes to this position, I think, not just with her experience in CETA, but well served by her, uh, her time as Secretary General of Save the Children Sweden and as he head of Save the Children International. And, uh, you know, from her own experience of Save the Children, it's an excellent, excellent NGO that Irish Aid is very proud to, to work with uh, in a number of places. And indeed, any of the Save staff that have come through and worked with us have always been amongst the best of the employees that we have across the world. And I think that's a testament to, to an organization with a very strong sense of itself and the values and, 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 and a very strong sense of, of international development. So thank you for that. And uh, she's also worked, uh, Charlotte's also worked uh, on communications for the Swedish Red Cross. Um, as I said, she's here today in her capacity as chair of the DAC. But I think it would be very interesting, it would be very good for us to hear uh, and I certainly I could learn from her experiences of heading an international development cooperation division. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, would be this interest in that. Ireland is a member and core supporter of the Development Assistance Committee, and uh, the DAC provides a unique international forum where major development cooperation providers come together to coordinate policy and improve the effectiveness of their development cooperation programs. Through its peer reviews, DAC monitors commitments made by donors to increase the effectiveness of the development cooperation policies and programs. And the DAC's work on development statistics sets the international standard for defining and recording official development assistance. And that all sounds quite technical, but I think the normative value of that shouldn't be underestimated, partly because it tells us where we are relative to our peers, partly because it keeps us all honest, in a sense. Um, it, it makes sure that when we say we're going to give ODA, that we give it to the areas that we say we're going to give it and don't get distracted, maybe down cul-de-sacs and alleyways. And it's also a really useful tool to use in internal resource debates with ministries of finance, etc. And I wouldn't underestimate that. And it's also really important uh, to helping shape the discourse in the development community. So you take things like the SDGs, how do you translate that into actions? It's through discussions around the DAC table and the arguments uh, which are often quite fierce on what are look at times to be abstruse technical issues, but are at heart intensely political and about our vision for changing the world, uh, to put it in, in, 
big worlds, but that's what the SDGs are. It is about changing the world and making it better. Um, maybe we shouldn't hide from that kind of language from time to time. Um, also, it's the network effect, valuable networks in research, uh, policy, in information sharing, and fact-based multilateralism. Fact-based is something we don't do an awful lot of these days, and it's great that there's a resource in Paris where there are facts, and we don't have to go to Twitter to get uh, a negative. Um, and it's something that Ireland is dedicated to maintaining and protecting. Um, that's why this year, I think we're the ter third largest contributor to the DAC uh, and its networks, and that's something we want to continue to be, is a very important partner uh, for the DAC. Um, I mentioned the DAC reform agenda. Um, you know, it's really important that the DAC is responsive to current global challenges, and there are many, and I think that's why some of the debates have been so difficult uh, and challenging, and where people are coming at how you do this from very, very different ideological perspectives. Um, Charlotte has steered that very, very well, um, and I think, you know, uh, she's been informed of that in part by somebody who's no stranger to this building, Mary Robinson, uh, who outlined a vision uh, for the DAC uh, in the context of Agenda 2030 through her work uh, uh, of the DAC, on the, uh, as chair of the DAC high-level panel. Um, Ireland is working across the board on, on, on that reform agenda and, and looking at Agenda 2030 in the OECD, uh, uh, as you would imagine, but also at the UN. Um, and I just, I'll finish on this. We're in the process of developing a new white paper on development aid, which hopefully will, you know, bear, will come to light next, next summer-ish. Don't hold us to any particular date. Uh, but um, we're developing how we'll take that forward. But I think many of the questions that will come out of the discussion today and already in that DAC reform agenda are questions which are going to have to tease through in the context of how we move to that white paper and how Ireland better responds to the Sustainable Development Goals um, and how hopefully we can begin to grow our overseas development assistance again after a few years of what we can maybe charitably call consolidation. Um, so uh, I think today's discussion comes at a at an important time, and within that we'll also be engaging with the DAC and, and it, its networks. So look, enough about us. Uh, I think today is all about what Charlotte's going to say, so look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much for coming. She's directly off the, off the plane, so uh, you know it's very good that uh, we get Charlotte's thoughts unfiltered. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I feel um, very humbled and very pleased to be here. I'm, I must start by saying, uh, by ap apologizing for being late. Uh, there's a lot of power in my role, but not flying the plane. So, <laughs> so apologies for that. Uh, and good afternoon. And thank you for spending time uh, here today. And I very much want to start by saying, uh, to thank the Institute for International and European Affairs and Irish Aid for co-hosting this, uh, this uh, IIEA Development Matters lecture series because if there's something that we need uh, very much of these days is, to, uh, is dialogue, uh, to come together and exchange and really uh, <coughs> Uh, work hard on delivering on promises that we in different uh, roles and cap capacities took in 2015 uh, to uh, deliver on the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. And I think it's very much through these kind of series that we can continue to, uh, to keep awareness high uh, and to continue to discuss perhaps interest of uh, conflict of interests which will be there when we start to think about an holistic whole of government uh, agenda which the 2030 agenda is about. So I really think this is a good initiative so thank you for that. Uh, I would also like to say to you to start with that Mary Robinson, uh, it was, it's been fantastic for me personally to have had the opportunity to uh, be kind of um, uh, well, she, she reported to the DAC, uh, the high-level panel's report on the future of the DAC. And she spoke a lot about uh, an attitude for the DAC that she wanted to, to bring along with the, with the uh, agenda. And that under the two words of a servant leader. 
Uh, and I do think that uh, the DAC uh, has to think through what that means, because uh, we are currently 30 countries, uh, kind of rich. Uh, we've been in place for more than 50 years. And when we started to do our work, uh, it was not about 30 countries. Uh, it was some 50 plus years ago. Uh, and some rich countries, industrialized, came together to discuss uh, rules and regulations, standards uh, on uh, how to serve. I don't think perhaps we use the word serve, uh, but maybe. Uh, how to work with development uh, aid for more, for pro for poor countries, not industrialized. Uh, and it was a very dualistic relationship. Uh, but today, when the DAC thinks about our future, uh, we need to realize that on one hand, we have been, we are still a very rich community. And if you think about the DAC uh, as 30 resourceful members, but also housed in the OECD, a powerhouse of knowledge, facts, evidence, and all of the things that we can bring to the table. Uh, I think we have to realize that we, we have a lot of resources and power, if you will. Uh, but we are not the ones who are going to deliver the Agenda 2030 on our own. Uh, and to be able to continue to serve uh, the globe on the 2030 Agenda, uh, an attitude of being a servant leader or a servant leader uh, is important for the way we do our work. And Mary Robinson certainly put a lot of emphasis on that. So why am I here with you today? Well, as the chair of the Development Assistance Committee, uh, I have led uh, the efforts to reform the DAC, as said in the introduction. We want the DAC to be able to continue to be relevant uh, for our members and relevant for, for the landscape in which we work with development. We want the DAC to be relevant. Most of us here can agree that we have witnessed remarkable improvements around the world during the last decades. Unfortunately, not many people talk about that uh, in the media. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that, for instance, when I was born, and I'm, it wasn't yesterday, so I admit that, but when I was born, half of all humans lived in extreme poverty. Today, only one out of ten finds themselves in these dire circumstances. And according to the World Bank data, around 45 countries have left the category of low-income country during the last 30 years. Child mortality and maternal mortality has decreased fast in development, developing countries during the last 25 years. And we still have to work for every child to get educated. But while we do that, we have to remind ourselves that access to primary education has reached 90% globally. And long-term development assistance has been instrumental in achieving th these results, particularly when it comes to ensuring basic health and education. We, the development people, know that ODA or aid is not the only solution, has not been the only solution, won't be the only solution, but we have to take some credit uh, and remind people that things have improved. Uh, because every day in the media, we run the risk of just being reminded of what's left to do, and especially that development assistance is under scrutiny much more than perhaps before. So it's important to kind of stand uh, firmly in results have actually been achieved. We in the development community and Ireland as a generous donor country should take note of this. Ireland's aid programme is internationally renowned for having a clear overall vision for development cooperation and delivering effectively on commitments to international development and grounding its policies in the needs and priorities of its partner countries. To keep commitments, 
to live by the principle of ownership should be something that would, should go for all members in the DAC. Uh, we have to constantly talk about that, and Ireland is very, very important as a member in the conversation within the DAC. A little bit of a watchdog sometimes, and I mean that in a positive way on one hand. On the other hand, you shouldn't have to, but you do. Countries like Ireland <coughs> set an important example when it comes to counterbalancing rhetoric uh, in the OECD countries about national interest and directing development cooperation policies and aid spending. Your neighbours in, in another island, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, this is on the record, so, so I will be very clear. Uh, it's fantastic to be able to have 0 0.7 of BNI uh, as a commitment. Uh, binding by law, uh, it was celebrated uh, when it, uh, it was said, uh, but it's very interesting to see how uh, difficult it is uh, to keep uh, in pace with public uh, when you have commitments like that. And we can see a fierce media landscape, for instance, in, in the UK, uh, really making uh, aid uh, as a policy area questioned by many. And I would say that what we face in the DAC today is a bit of... of uh, kind of a, of a volatile uh, landscape where some countries have to, to defend this policy area domestically. Uh, and while doing that, some of the countries that we work for lose a bit of trust in us as predictable partners because we have to, to in different ways, work in our own countries uh, domestically. Uh, and I would say that that is one of the challenges, and again, where Ireland plays a very important role because you are trusted uh, as, as a partner. Uh, and some other countries have uh, more difficult in, in the bilateral trust today because uh, more and more of ODA is being spent at home. Ireland is not the biggest donor uh, although the third biggest donor to DAC, which was fantastic, but not the biggest donor. In 2016, uh, you or it provided US, uh, 802 US dollars, 802 million US dollars in net ODA. And that's preliminary data, I should say. Uh, it represents 33% of your gross national income. Uh, however, this was a 12% increase in real terms from 2015 and the first time in seven years that the Irish government increased the ODA budget. <coughs> so even if it's not 0 0.7, uh, it's uh, on a good trajectory. However, international development cooperation is not only about volume, it is about quality as much as vol volume quality through policies and practices. And here Ireland plays an important role by supporting and enabling partner governments and civil society organizations to lead their development efforts themselves. As I said, partners value Ireland as an honest broker and for being a long-term partner, working according to international best practices. Building on this Trust, countries like Ireland must lead the way in transforming development cooperation to meet the challenges we face today and tomorrow. Again, thank you for discussing development in this series. And we should, we should take note of this prog progress. At the same time, be clear that we face great challenges here and now as well as in the years to come. There is still much work to be done to eliminate poverty. And we need to reach those furthest behind and those most vulnerable. They might not have increased in amount of people, but they are completely stuck, left behind. Uh, and we have not succeeded yet in leaving no one behind. And when we embark on the SDG agenda, Ireland is con constantly reminding us in the DAC discussions about this fact. 
But we also must change our ways of working. We need to accelerate the shift from unsustainable carbon-based energy, unsustainable production and consumption patterns. The number of refugees and displaced persons in countries of origin, in neighboring countries and in our own countries needs a more comprehensive response. During our October high-level meeting, members agreed to adopt the proposed clarifications for reporting costs for receiving and hosting refugees in donor countries as part of ODA, as part of the official development assistance. And thanks to this harmonization effort, we established which costs are in line with ODA definition and which relate to the integration of refugees or donors' internal and security policies, and do not, therefore, conform the ODA definition. And this decision provides for more transparency and more coherent spending and reporting, increasing accountability among members. We needed this improved reporting to ensure both the protection of financing for development, for long-term poverty and conflict prevention, and also the accurate acknowledgement of in-donor refugee spending. Civil society is still pushing hard for the DAC to go further and not uh, count in-donor costs as ODA, uh, but this clarification uh, is a way for the DAC to prove how important this tool is today as well as for 50 years ago. And I welcome very much uh, the push that we put on ourselves on transparency. Uh, it's going to be possible to compare, it's going to be po possible to see what things, you know, what we spend the money on. And I really think that the DAC can not be proud, but at least be pleased with the fact that we took a decision on a very political issue, uh, very much scrutinized by our watchdogs, which we should be. We also needed this since we have seen divergent practices across donors that cast doubt on the credibility of ODA statistics. 85% of refugees are not in our countries. 85% are in what we call developing countries. And the more we spend at home, which ODA figures show that we do, we spend more money on humanitarian immediate needs and less than before on long-term development in sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, again, going back to trust. If that's a trend, not only something that we see now, but if that trend continues, uh, Partner countries might start to uh, talk again about the DAC being a rich club in the north, not necessarily a partner. So this decision in that context was also very important. Since 2015, we have a global development consensus based on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as we know, including the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. This decision was a game changer, demanding increased partnership, increased financial flows, and increased focus on leaving no one behind. This agenda calls for a transformation of development cooperation, while upholding the much needed levels of ODA to support those most in need. This transformation means that we need to find the right balance between guarding the integrity of ODA and using ODA in a catalytic manner to leverage other financial resources for sustainable development. Our October high-level meeting also facilitated the ad adoption of something that we call blended finance principles. And now we're a bit technical again. But what it means was uh, to decide on how do we make sure that when we use ODA to crowd in other financial flows, that the way we do it is developmental in nature. That it's adding 
value for development and is not just using public money for financial flows that could be there on commercial basis. So it's really safeguarding the principles of development and to get one common language for doing so. The OECD DAC work pro program on blended finance uh, aims to distill and promote best practice and develop guidance that will assist the development cooperation community in delivering development impact from emerging blended finance approaches. And we can build on the achievements so far, but we also face new challenges and we need new ways of working, as I said. Development assistance is more and more an integrated part of a whole of government approach to sustainable development. And sustainable development for a country, a region or a city is more and more an agenda way beyond government, calling for a whole of society approach. Governments and the public sector should not shy away from their role in leading the change, but must acknowledge that others will lead as well. And sometimes the de development community is being asked to kind of, well, stay a little bit away on the side because Agenda 2030 is, is not about aid. It's about all the other things. So don't lead that change because then everybody else might think that we're, you know, we're traditional aid and we're trying to do so much new things here. So perhaps you shouldn't lead, some people say. And I say, well, where are you then? Where's the rest of the society who wakes up every morning dreaming about this agenda? I think that we need to be co-leading this change uh, and that we should be proud of uh, the knowledge and the tradition, if you will, uh, that we bring to the table. But we need to find ways thinking of how do you lead change when you, you're there to kind of crowd in others and perhaps step back yourself. How do you do that? Motivating people to really leverage on this. And I think that's the uh, challenge we have as leaders in many different capa capacities. The servant leader who's out there to, to inspire change by others and still keep the motivation high for staff who might think, am I less important? Because you're always talking about somebody else there. You're talking about the finance market. You know, I mean, so. so in the daily life of delivering this Agenda 2030, we have both governance and management challenges. And we should perhaps not uh, think that everybody breathe this agenda just before, because we do. So finally, I will tell you a little bit about how are we trying to make DAC relevant for this future to deliver on this agenda. DAC members and the greater development community can make better use of the DAC as a hub for building knowledge, improving policy, and stimulating collective efforts. DAC can achieve so much more through increasing its outreach and its collaboration with each other and with others. And that is why I, as a chair, based on proposals from the high-level panel that led by Mary Robinson and with uh, a lot of dialogues within the DAC with, with uh, Ireland and others. That is why I proposed ways in which the DAC <laughs> should modernise and adapt. In its transformation, uh, the DAC will build on the core strengths, strengths of the committee. We will not shy away from what has built the DAC the DAC has a unique role and we should maintain it. We will continue to define and measure development cooperation. We will be the guardian of the ODA definition and monitor its flows. We will set standards for providers' engagement in development cooperation and facilitate members' mutual accountability for development efforts. We will still promote learning perhaps even more than before, promote learning, exchange of views, 
and coordinating among members on good practices in development cooperation. We do that today, we will keep on doing it even more. Going forward, the DAC will also focus on development impact. Because what we have focused on so far is a bit more on what we have provided, the 0 0.7, uh, the figures of, of money provided, but not necessarily on what we have achieved as a community. Members do that separately, but the policy area suffers a bit from too little uh, focus on impact and a common narrative on uh, what development really delivers, if you, if you wish. So DAC will put more emphasis on impact, but also more emphasis on the mobilization of resources. Be a, the leader of development finance, if you will. And that is about continue to work hard to get the ODA increased, but also to use ODA as the cast catalyst for other financial resources including also working with domestic resources, knowing that tax is a very, very important part of delivering uh, development finance. The DAC will learn from existing development approaches, as we do today, but we will give more focus to learn uh, and explore new approaches to development. By, for instance, embracing innovative practices and the digitalization of societies. The DAC will reach out to influence and to be influenced, for instance, by using the convening power we have to stay in constant dialogue with a diverse and growing development community. The DAC has been spoke about as a club. We would like to see the DAC more of a hub for development. The DAC will be open, transparent, and hold each other to account. Sometimes I think that we are a bit too polite. Peer reviews are very important. But are we really addressing uh, challenges enough? Or are we dependent, if you will, uh, of, of watchdogs like civil society to really, really put the finger on, on the, the issues that our community need to address. I think that we need to be in the driver's seat. I think that we need to be the ones who kind of put the problem on the table and dare to discuss it. This is a little bit of a discussion within the DAC because some members don't need, want criticism domestically because they fight for their policy area. So if the chair enters into that uh, context and says, blah, 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 it might actually do more harm than good. So obviously when we talk about holding ourselves to account, we need to know in what way. But I do think that we allow media to play too much of that role. So I have proposed that we should be a bit tougher. And you know, Kira, that I'm, that's not that's not what I'm most popular about, if I'm at all popular. So, <laughs> but we also, we also need to work in effective governance systems and structures within the DAC. Uh, and what, that, what is interesting for, for you, perhaps, is that the, this agenda sounds like we're going to do a lot of what others do. Uh, the UN does a lot, uh, and, and other uh, international organizations have roles to play. And it's important for the DAC to be sure that we are complementing and that we add to a system of international organizations and, and that we avoid duplication. Uh, but what, what's still true is that the DAC can bring uh, facts, <laughs> learnings, standards, normative work to the table and the community that we, that we are is still being uh, a very resourceful community that has to deliver. So if we could use that as a magnet for delivering uh, and inspiring other actors, we should not shy away from doing so. Uh, we are expected to lead, uh, not to duplicate, but to play an active leading role. And our efforts do not stop here. The decisions taken uh, at the high-level meeting, where the meeting did decide uh, to embark on this vision for the DAC, 
uh, and to renew or, or to actually to a new mandate for the DAC. Uh, the decisions at the Halyeva meeting have laid the groundwork for our reform, uh, but there is more to be done to support the reform in our own work and in our own communication. Uh, we have put the words on paper after almost, after almost a year of discussion, but now this reform will be taken into implementation mode, uh, and that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we're gonna see if we are successful. Uh, and it, our efforts will be judged by our ability to achieve the 2030 agenda. Less than 13 years left. And we know that it means doing things differently more efficiently, and changing the narrative of the effectiveness of development cooperation to continue to build universal support for the 2030 Agenda. Thank you for being part of this. I hope that you will join uh, yourself and others in, in this important journey for development and for the DAC in its role in that whole of society attempt. So thank you. <laughs>